what and what is not. And of course, you can always ask us any questions. So we want to have the course be full of integrity and not have you get into any kind of problems. Let's move on to the lecture. Uh, I'm going to use the tablet for a while and then we'll segue into the uh, doing some proofs by hand. Uh, you might ask, why do we do some proofs by hand? Uh, I've actually consulted with some colleagues of mine about this as well to validate my opinion. It's extremely difficult to do proofs by typing them into the computer. There is a branch of computer science called automated theorem proving where people do exactly that. But these are mathematical proofs, even if they're about programs, often it's easier to visualize them and do them by hand, at least for me. Um, and it feels, it feels like a more constructive process. So that's one reason we switched, and also I think it's a bit more legible. Let's continue by talking some about the content for today. And again, SICP is very good, Ableton and Sussman. A number of handouts are already on the web for you to look at. So the main topic today is mathematical induction, but we'll do that in the context of this class. So basically, we're going to talk about iterative versus recursive processes. And induction is a reasoning tool, a formal tool for understanding our programs. So where are we in the class? We've seen how to write scheme expressions, we've had assignments, and even how to evaluate them. That's the substitution model. And we know now something about how to define procedures, even recursive, by which we mean syntactically recursive or self-referential ones. And today, we're going to dig quite a bit deeper we're going to look at the computational processes that are generated by procedures and the correctness of the values they compute. So we're going to be developing models that let us reason about whether or not a procedure computes the desired answer, building on our understanding of the substitution model. So you had a short assignment on sort of a strange or unusual multiplication uh, problem. I want to talk about two more somewhat elementary ways of looking at multiplication as repeated addition. Um, let's look at this one called times one. By the way, these next lecture notes are online. So basically, this is, these are both procedures that compute A times B by adding A B times. And note that in the types here that B has to be an integer because we want to do it some discrete number of times. I'll ask you later about why A is any number and B must be an integer. So obviously, a recursive procedure in some sense it uh, calls itself to, to uh, compute A times B. Now, as we look at uh, what's going on here, uh, here's another way of doing it. And what I, I want to mention a couple of things. This is really kind of more on the uh, sy syntactic side. What I'd like to do here is write a let statement. I would love to do this. Um, I can't quite, but let me fix that in a minute. So. What I want to do here is I want to define a procedure and return it. That's what the Lambda does. Lambda always makes a procedure and returns it. And then what I want to do here is I want to bind that to a variable, namely iter, for iterate like this. So iter will be a procedure that I've made on the fly like this. And then down here, I'm going to call iter. So this is what I'd like to do, but it's not quite right. And the reason is that at the time this is defined, uh, it doesn't know what iter is because it's recursive. So there's sort of a circularity here. We want the lambda expression to evaluate a procedure that calls something called iter, but iter is undefined at that time. This would give an error. And so the way we, way we handle that is there's a special version of let. So let basically is a, a, basically a special form. It's really syntactic sugar. It lets you define a local variable within a procedure. And it works great, just we need to do something special in the case where we're defining a value in terms of itself. So we have a, a special form for this called let rec, or let recursive, like this, and it's used down here. So here I've changed the let to let rec and everything will work. We'll see a lot more about this in discussions and in the lecture notes and so forth. So this basically says, make a procedure, it's a procedure of two arguments, C and results, bind it to a variable called iter, and it's okay that if in the body of the procedure it calls itself, it can handle that, which is great. And um, the thing is that both of these procedures work. Uh, we can multiple, we can, you know, call times one and times two on two arguments, and we're going to uh, get an answer. Now, some things to note here that I think are pretty interesting. Um, uh, I'm going to talk more about let rec later 
probably more in recitation section. But the key thing to note here is that while times one is a sort of simple recursive procedure, counts down by one in some sense, we have something different going on here with times two. So, but basically, if you look at what's going on here, iter's first argument, which is C, it, it counts up, it counts down from B by steps of one. Its second argument, which is called results, counts up from zero by steps of A. So C over here, right, is gonna count uh, down from B by steps of one. That's the decrement that you see over here. And its second argument here, result, counts up from zero by steps of A. All right, so let's trace through using the substitution model to see kind of how these work. You may wish to bookmark that page or screenshot it so you can come back. I'm gonna look at times one first, this code here, and I'm gonna do the substitution model, but I'm gonna ignore the apply stages because they're enormous and they're basically all the same. So just the eval steps of the substitution model. Okay, so what do we get here? Um, we get something that looks like this. So at the first call, you know, basically we don't bottom out for a while, right? We, we don't hit the, hit the situation B equals zero for a long time, namely six steps. So basically here we call ourselves recursively at this step, at this step here, we, uh, we add six and then we call ourselves recursively decrementing the three to two, then decrementing the three to one. And these plus sixes add up over here like this. So the key thing to notice about this is that there are all these deferred operations. That's all the pluses that haven't been done yet. They can't be done until we return from the recursion here. And then all that entire stack of, of plus sixes we have to do has to be done. So you have to keep track of those. So these are called deferred operations, very important term that we'll come back to. On the other hand, let's go back and look at times two here, which is pretty interesting. Remember, C counts down from B by steps of one, result counts up from zero by steps of A, and, we'll, and the, again, just the eval steps of the substitution model look like this. We call times two with six and three. At the next, at the very first thing it does is it's called iter, keeps calling iter until the termination condition. So first it calls iter with three zero, that's the initiation call. Then what it does is again, it decrements the, the three by one, it increments the zero by six, and it calls again like this with two and six, then one and 12, then zero and 18. Then the termination condition is hit. Remember there's a termination condition in iter here with c equals zero, and then it returns its value. So again, the first argument to iter counts down by steps of one, the second argument counts up by steps of six. So two very different looking ways to compute the same thing. And the main thing to notice here is that there are no operations waiting to happen on return. And that's a hint to what is gonna happen here. The system doesn't have to keep track on that. So lots of deferred operations here, no deferred operations here. And that's the key point of this example. So here's a distinction from other things you may have seen in other courses, perhaps. Uh, both times one and times two are what we call syntactically recursive. And that just means they refer to themselves in the body of the text. But times one generates what we call a recursive process. In other words, each call is gonna generate deferred operations. And that means event, it's gonna use more and more space as it runs and eventually it'll destroy itself. Times two on the other hand, generates what we call an iterative process. So there are no deferred operations and you can compile this to run in constant space. There are no operations waiting to happen. So times one has to use the system, the stack of the system to keep track of all these intermediate computations. And times two uses an explicit state variable, which is the, parameter result, this keeps track of all those intermediate values for you. So the key point is that times two is what we call tail recursive. The last thing it does is it calls itself and there's nothing left to do once it returns. And this means you don't have to return the value to the previous caller, you can just return it back to iter's initial caller, which is times two. And this will be discussed a lot more in problem sets and short assignments and in section, of course. So some languages optimize these tail recursive calls. So no space is wasted, no extra space is ever used for the recursive call. 
when it's tail recursive, that is. This is a very good thing, and Scheme recognizes tail recursive function calls, and it knows what to do. It doesn't save any deferred operation state when it makes one. And that means if you write a tail recursive function, it will run in constant space. So in other words, the amount of space just is a constant. It doesn't change with the size of the input, which case would be the numbers. Now, in contrast, some other languages, even nice languages, don't have this. For example, Python does not support tail recursion. And that means that most of the assignments in this class won't run in Python, and that's why real computer scientists use Python for scripting, but not for serious work where they have to do lots of computation, because with no tail recursion, you're fairly limited. Now, because you can do this iteration in constant space, Scheme doesn't really have special iteration constructs like while, do, until, loop, and so forth. It's, this is a white lie, it actually does have them, but you can't use them in this class. You have to use the tail recursive formulation. So we just use tail recursion to generate iterative processes, and that's how we'll do iteration. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. We have a way to write programs that makes them massively faster. So tail recursive procedures can run for with really, really big inputs and not use a lot of extra space. And if you think that this is, uh, you know, some weird theory thing, it's, it's really not. So when we were developing problem set two, we initially had one of the procedures that did a reverse and some other things be encoded recursively, like a recursive process, and everything was blowing up, and I had a TA who put in destructive operations and things to deal with that. And then we looked at it and realized, wait, let's just recall, let's just code that up as a tail recursive process. Instead of blowing up, it will run in constant space, and Therefore, you get the nice problem set two that's already on the web. But don't start it till after Wednesday because you have problems that one on your mind. All right. So that's what I wanted to do to introduce tail recursion, recursive processes, and iterative processes. And we'll come back to that. Remember, recursive processes have deferred operations. Tail recursive processes do not have deferred operations. They're called iterative processes. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about next is really one of the hearts. Octopi and other clever creatures have many hearts, so I will have many, say many hearts too. It's the heart of one of the hearts of mathematical, mathematical induction discrete math. So we have times one. Again, that's this procedure here. This, we'll look at the recursive one here, times one, this guy here. How do we know that it computes the right value? And it's somewhat straightforward for times one, but we'll see more complicated procedures very shortly. So how do we know this guy actually computes the right value? I mean, how do we approach that? Um, we can't check them all. We can't just randomly check. We want to know it works for any A and you know, a B in some sense. And if you think this is trivial, the procedure clearly loses for negative B, right? If you stick in negative B for this guy here, it's going to run forever because it's going to start with a negative B and it's never going to hit zero. So it's not insane to ask what parameters it works for and to prove that. In fact, far from insane, it's good practice. So we'd like to know whether or not times one computes the right answer. And we're going to use two tools together, mathematical induction, which I'm going to teach you again, but you might have seen some of, and the substitution model, which you're just learning about. So the key idea, and this is a key idea in computer science as well, is we're going to learn how to show the equivalence of a scheme program, scheme expression, to a mathematical statement about its value. And the latter is called a specification, sometimes called a contract. It describes what the program computes. So show the equivalence between a scheme function and a mathematical statement about the value it computes. And then we can think about the program just in terms of the contract rather than the implementation, and it allows us to think more abstractly. We can use it in other places. We can depend on the implementation in other parts of the program to meet the abstraction. So let's go over induction. I'm not going to assume you know anything about induction, but if you do, this will be uh, a refresher and maybe a slightly different take. Why induction? So induction is the basic proof technique for computer science. You know, we have some really good staff, I think. You know, the TAs and all of these folks are computer scientists and every day they wake up in the morning and before they brush their teeth, they ask 
what am I going to do induction on today? Computer scientists do it all the time. You need to know it. It's essential. And it, the nice thing is it almost exactly matches recursion, which is pretty cool because we're doing a lot of stuff with recursion. So let's look at a case for sort of a example here. And I look at the natural numbers. And I'm going to write these using this math font like this and like this. And this will be, so we'll start at zero. That's a convention. All the natural numbers, it's an infinite set. And I want you to ponder this, you know, this n is this very compact representation for an infinite set. And you can imagine even having an advanced programming language where you could have a variable for the natural number so you could pass it to other programs or other expressions and use it just like you would a function or a value or an integer or a floating point number. And if you're asking about that paid commercial advertisement, Scheme is one of those advanced languages where you can define with one letter an infinite object such as the natural numbers and pass it as parameters or return it from functions. But back to induction, suppose we have some property we want to ask about a natural number, right? Uh, and we denote that it's a natural number by saying, say, n is a natural number, right? So we might want to have a property, property P1, which says n is even. Property two, P2 says, you know, n is the product of three primes. Property P3 is n is the sum of four squares and so forth. And we'd like to prove, although obviously maybe it's not true, we'd like to prove that the property P holds for all n's, an infinite number. So this is a very nice technique. So the basic idea of this is that we're going to prove a base case. We're going to prove that the property P holds for the smallest element in the set, typically zero, could, could be different for a different set. And the induction step is going to say that we're going to prove that uh, for any n, that if p holds for n, then it holds for n plus 1 as well. And don't worry, we'll do some examples. Um, and that's sort of the basic idea. We need the basis step, prove it for the lowest element of the set, the smallest element, p equals 0. And then uh, the induction step says, suppose you start anywhere. Just call it n. And suppose the property holds for n show it holds for n plus 1, 1 higher. And so you might write this mathematically as saying, oh, sorry about that, is that, I don't know what's going on here. This would be represented just p holds for 0. So in other words, p is a predicate. It's either true or false on a number n. So this shows p of 0. And the second step could be written mathematically as p of n implies p of n plus 1. So in other words, assume it holds for n prove it holds for n plus 1. This could also be written as if p of n, then p of n plus 1. Good enough. So the way to think about this sort of graphically is that the basis step gives us p of 0. Good enough. And b, the b step means exactly this. It means p of 0 implies p of 1. So if you know p of 0, then you know p of 1 is true. And that then in turn means that p of 0 and, this is the and sign, and in mathematics, p of 1, that's going to apply p of 2, and so forth. So conceptually, induction, can you think of it as climb, like climbing a ladder? So the basis step shows we can get to the bottom of the ladder, and the induction step shows we can get from one step to the next for any step. Also think of it. One metaphor is knocking over dominoes. The basis step is the first domino falls. And the induction step says, hey, if the nth and all previous dominoes fall, then so does the n plus first. All right. So induction has a recipe. And we want to see the recipe in your proofs to get credit. And we'll go over this a few times. So the recipe is you need to say what variable, often n, are you doing induction on? What's the property you're trying to prove? p of n. Remember, p is a predicate, i.e. it's a function. You can think of p as a function, in this case, from the natural numbers to true or false. So p of n could be true or false. So what is the property you're trying to prove, p of n? Next, you prove the base case. In this, often it's p of 0. And then, as before, the induction step, 
assume p of n and prove p of n plus one. And we have a handout for you with many examples, but I'll do some here. So what I'd like to do now is uh, actually do a proof using these techniques. And I want to prove that times one returns the correct value. So let's try an inductive proof. Now in English, we would say that what we're trying to prove is this. We're trying to prove that times one applied to A and B is mathematically equal to A times B for B positive. Now being a mathematician, I'm going to state that as a claim. So I put a claim here in blue. And that's what we'll do when we start writing things down. So as I go into this, I, by the way, I've written all this out in text, and you can look at this, which is great. Um, but I'm going to do it by, by hand and take questions and so forth. So two things. I'm going to ask these questions, and I'm going to come back to it and ask you why for both of these questions. So times one has two parameters, A and B. I'm going to induct on B, not on A. So why? Think about that. Come back to it. I'll ask you. Think about why do we induct on B, not on A. And second, we're going to ask you to do this, and we're going to do it. You're going to have these on midterms and finals and so forth. So your proof to be valid has to use both the substitution model and the induction hypothesis. So you have to use both induction and the substitution model. So I'm going to ask you why that is. Why can't I just do one? Right? Why do you need both? Um, so think about this so we can, we can, we can uh, answer that. And by the way, I'll answer both these questions, but I want to take your answers from the class. So uh, with that having been said, what I'd like to do is move to the document camera. Uh, I, and it'll take me just a minute to set up. So while I do that, why don't you enjoy this cartoon? Canvas back duck club. Salesman wanted. Salesman wanted. Are you guys salesmen? That's fine. Come on, we got a job. Your troubles are over. Here we are. We are the best salesmen that ever sailed. Got a piece of bacon in your pocket? Why? You keep me busy, I'll get some eggs for breakfast. You try that and I'll crack your head like an eggshell. Come on. You men ever sold anything? Why, certainly. Anything we could lay our hands on. Gentleman said sold, not stole. Oh, I misunderstood him. Pardon me. Well, what do we sell? Memberships in the Canvasback Duck Club. Canvasback? When I was a fighter, that's what they called me. I was on the canvas so much. I used to stand like that. Not for long. And then my footwork and the rosin in my hey, eyes. Canvas. See that? Oh, oh, oh. Ah, gentlemen, gentlemen, listen to me. With this proposition, you can't go wrong. Remember this, boys. Every red-blooded man is a potential hunter at heart. Why, there's one in every office. That's right, boys. All you have to do is appeal to the primitive in them, and you can't go wrong. And for every membership you sell, you get 10% of $50. Think of it! All right, hopefully we're back. Let me know, can you hear me? And can you see the screen on this new setup? Yep. All right, good, thank you. That's great. All right, so let's do this proof and go through it, talk about this a little bit. Why should this be true? So I just to keep me, you know, just to keep me understanding what's going on here, I put the function up here. I've actually clipped it physically to uh, the paper over here. And here's our induction recipe just to remind us what's going on. OK. Now, uh, let's start doing our proof. So what's the intuition behind this? So the main thing I wanted to mention is that the, the function itself even looks like an induction. And this is one of the beautiful things about Scheme, is that the match, the impedance match, if you're an engineer, or the match between recursion and induction is almost identical. And to a mathematician, you know, this almost, you know, experienced mathematician, this is a straightforward proof. It'll not be straightforward to you for some time. But look at this. Here we have the basis case, right? The basis case is right here. 
when b equals zero, right? It's stated for you right there. And then down here, we have the induction step, right? What we're doing in the induction step is we're defining the value we're going to compute in terms of times one at smaller arguments. So that's kind of the setup. You can look, kind of look at the code and you can see the, uh, the nature of the basis, base case or the basis case and the induction step. That's, that's the intuition anyway. So let's see what, how we can sort of go about proving this, think about it. So again, I'm gonna use the induction recipe rather uh, carefully in this case. So let's, let's kind of write out what we're trying to do. I'll say claim. From start, I wanna say times one applied to A and B is equal to A times B for all B that are greater than or equal to zero. Right, so that's what we're trying to do here. So again, this is pretty interesting, right? We're stating, we're claiming the mathematical equivalence of a scheme expression, the value on the left-hand side. Remember, every thing in scheme is an expression and every expression has a value. We're claiming the equivalence of a scheme expression and uh, a mathematical value on the right. So a mathematical statement on the right and a scheme expression on the left. So how would we do this proof? Let's think about this. Well, I want to use the induction. I want to prove it by induction. I want to use the induction recipe. So I'll say this, proof. And I'll state by induction. And let's follow the recipe. What variable? Well, my variable is B and it's a natural number. Good. Now, I'm gonna move that cursor, it's driving me crazy. Okay, so we're one quarter of the way done in our induction proof. I mean, it's really remarkably fast when you think about it. Uh, what property we're trying to prove? Property, step two. The property, uh, which I'll call P of B, property of B, it's that times one applied to A and B is equal mathematically to A times B. So that's what we'd like to prove. What is the property we're trying to prove? Let's do the basis. This is gonna be when B equals zero. Let's look at the code. Well, times one of A applied to zero, which has been evaluated in this case, and the reason for this, I'm gonna use the substitution model. By the substitution model, this is what? Let's look at the body here. This is equal to if equals zero, zero, then return zero, and then some other stuff. And this indeed returns zero because zero equals zero. Why is this correct? Well, it's correct because a times zero equals zero as desired. So now we're done with the basis case. So this is really good progress. We're three quarters of the way through our induction proof. And what remains is the induction step or the last step here. So I'll just call that induction or you could call it induction step if you like. And it looks like this. So remember, I wanna assume in this case, I wanna assume P of B and prove P of B plus one. Let's write that down. So I say assume that times one of applied to A and B is equal to A times B. And if that's true, I need to show the following. This is mathematical, this is sort of jargon mathematicians use NOS stands for need only show. Then I need only show that times one applied to A and B plus one is equal to A times B plus one. And the reason it's called need only show is that the structure of the proof is such that as soon as I've showed that, the entire proof is done. And I'm gonna label this induction hypothesis because we're gonna to have to refer back to it. So I assume the induction hypothesis 
namely that the statement P of B is true for B, and then I'm gonna show it for P of B plus one. So this is just another way, this isn't part of the proof, this is an annotation just for y'all. I'll use, use a different color pen. This is just a way of stating that P of B implies P of B plus one. That's what I want, that's what I want to show. And of course the basis case here, what I already proven is P of zero. But I need to show this. This is not shown yet. This is what I want to claim. Okay. So we've done everything except this one step. We want to assume the induction hypothesis, namely assume that times one applied to A and B is equal to A times B mathematically. Again, interesting, right? This equivalence of a scheme expression and a mathematical statement. So all I have to do is show that times one applied to A and B plus one is equal to A times B plus one. So how do we do that? Substitution model. So let's do it. So times one, and we can look at the code up here, times one of A applied to B plus one, let's use the substitution model. That's gonna be equal to if equals B plus one, zero, return zero. Otherwise, we're going to add A to times one applied to A and minus B plus one, one. So let's look at this piece, which we now have to evaluate, reduce to a value. So over here, we can, we know that B plus one is not equal to zero. Why is that? Because B is in the natural numbers, which in this case start at zero. So the smallest it can be is zero. Both B can be a zero. The smallest B plus one can be as one. So we know that B plus one is not equal to zero. So this guy here returns false. And now we're on to this clause here. So this is what we have to evaluate. Let's go plus A times one A minus B plus one, one. We're almost home free. Let's evaluate this. This is going to just evaluate to B. So we get plus A times one A B. Now what's this equal to? Well, let's look at our induction hypothesis. Our induction hypothesis says that times one applied to A and B is equal to A times B. And we've already assumed it. So by the induction hypothesis, and this you do need to write in your proofs, by the induction hypothesis, this is equal to plus A times A times B. Now we simplify, we do some algebra, all substitution model. This is just equal to A plus A times B, which is equal to A times B plus one as desired. So this is our proof that, of what times one returns. We've just shown that times one times one applied to A and B here, computes A times B for any B that's non-negative and for any number whatsoever A, it doesn't matter what A is. So I would like to point out to you the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in solving this problem. So we're only about a third of the way through the lecture and I've already proven an infinite number of results. So remember, we did prove some things a little bit about square root, like gave you an exercise, does this actually compute the correct square root of two? And that would have been very painful to do for all numbers. But progressing from that in just less than a week, by using substitution model and mathematical induction, I can prove this is true for any B, and there are infinite number of Bs, so we've obtained, in some sense, an infinite number of theorems. Okay. 
so let me pause for just a second. We're doing pretty well on time, I think. How are we doing? Let me ask you if there are any questions about what I've done, and then I'm going to make some more comments about it. Um, I have a question, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, so I see that you wrote, like, assume times minus 1 AB, um, a, like, equals A times B. So, like, why are you able to assume that to prove it? And this is a very good question. Let me try to answer it in the following way. Um, so, it would have been perfectly fine. So, I'll say it in words, and then we'll do it. So it's perfectly fine if I had said instead, um, assume that times one a b minus one is equal to a times b minus one. And then prove that times one a b is equal to a b. So in other words, what I could have done is I could have decremented b here, 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 and here. And then the proof goes through with slight, slight changes but at the end, I can substitute back. So I wanted you to see it like this because this is how mathematicians usually do it. But your point is well taken in the sense that you need to understand uh, that you can do that substitution. Let's just do it right quick and, and see how that goes. I think that'd be a useful exercise. So let me do that, um, do that for you uh, to see what it's fine. So the, 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 Complaint is that here we're, we're, we want to prove that times one a b is equal to a times b, but here it looks like we've assumed it. So let's do it assuming it for one less. So I'll write it like this, and we'll do the induction step. So what I want to say is assume times one applied to a and b minus one is equal to a times b minus 1. And this will be our new induction hypothesis. Then I need only show that times 1 a b is equal to a times b. Right? So now we haven't assumed exactly what we're proving, even syntactically. So let's do that. I need, it makes the base case a little trickier. What I want to say, I have to say this, I have to say without loss of generality, assume B is greater than zero. So why is this okay? Without loss of generality, usually means mathematics, I don't need to explain it, but I will explain it since this is one of our proof, first proof classes. This is okay because there are two cases. One, B is positive, in which case I can proceed with the proof. The other case is B is zero, in which case I go to the base case, and I don't, don't use this. So now we can assume for the rest of this that B is positive, and I now have to figure out what this is equal to, like what is times one applied to A and B? What's that equal to, given that I've assumed this as my induction hypothesis? So of course, this is equal to the same thing as before almost, if equals b zero, return zero, otherwise we're going to plus a times one a minus b one, like that. By our argument before, this returns false, and now we have this form here. We have to now evaluate this guy here. So we have plus a times one a minus b one, which is equal to plus a times one a b minus one. Now let us look at our induction hypothesis here. So that then is equal by the induction hypothesis to plus a a times b minus 1, right? Which is just equal to a plus a b minus a, which is equal to a. So now we've done the proof. It's the same proof, but we've done the proof here, uh, assuming instead of 
basically assuming that the predicate times one applied to a and b minus one is equal to a times b minus one. And we've shown that times one a b is equal to a b. So first let me ask, are you happy with this proof? Um, I guess like, so like, like, why were you able to make that initial assumption in the first place? Was that because of the, like the zero case that you solved? Do, initial assumption in the new, in the second proof or the first? Yeah. Proof? Yeah. And then in the new proof with the uh, times a B minus one equals a times B minus one. No, I can assume anything I want mathematically, right? That's the way math works. When okay. I say assume it, I'm, I'm showing here, like before what I showed was P of B implies P of B plus one. And here, what I'm showing is P of B minus one implies P of B. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Right. So, so now let me argue why the two proofs are equivalent. Right? So what I can do instead is I can, I can basically just rename things. I can say, let, I'm going to use a new variable. I'm going to let C equal B minus one. Right? And so this, this, this clause be written as P of C. And then P of C implies P of C plus one. So once I've done the proof, I can just rename the variables. And that's kind of, that's kind of why it's okay to do what I had in the first place. So in other words, I could go through this entire proof and every place I had a B minus one, I could substitute a C. And every place I had a B, I could substitute a C plus one. And then I get a construct like this. And then if you like, I could rename this to be P of B implies P of B plus one. And that's why it was okay to have, ha, that, that's okay to, to, that's why it was okay to have what I had in the first place. So the way yeah, I'm- Thank you, thank you. Great question, by the way. But so the way a mathematician thinks of this intuitively is yes, you're trying to prove this, but the way we think about it, this is really shorthand for it. If I'm at B, can I get to B plus one? And it's sort of implied that if I said B minus one, I could get to B. But great question, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, IH stands for induction hypothesis. Okay. So let's come back to a couple of questions I asked before. Um, so I'm doing this induction on B, not on A. So why did I do the induction on B and not on A? Who'd like to hazard a hazard an answer to that question? Is it because B belongs to a finite set and A doesn't? So I, I, I think that's a good a good way of thinking about it, but actually B is not in a finite set because the integers aren't finite. So we, we I think we can have a base case for B. Well, that's a good way of thinking about it, is that there's a, a clear base set, base case. Um, so I think you're on the right track. Um, I mean, in some sense, I think the answer is in the code. I mean, in the code, A is never changing. So what would induction kind of mean here? Does that make sense? Let me put this another way. I think you think you're on the, uh, you're, you're on the right track in thinking about this, but let me, let me sort of think about this in another sense. So suppose I had a equals pi and b equals seven or b equals anything. So my proof already, b, b could equal seven, but I've, I've, my proof shows that this works for multiplying b times pi or b times anything. How about times one, four pi plus i times the square root of two times five. Like both of these are totally fine. Right. So the issue is that, first of all, in the code, only B is changing and it's changing stepwise. So it makes sense to induct on it. But the other thing is that if you have real numbers or even floating point numbers, let alone complex numbers like this, it's not clear how to do induction on such things. In fact, you can't do induction in the way that we're thinking about it. Can't really do induction on real numbers and complex numbers and so forth. So what I did by making A a number is that I can multiply anything. In fact, A could even be a matrix if you take linear algebra. 
and you're looking at looking at multiples of that matrix instead. So by making it general, we can take in anything at all, any kind of number, and we induct on the thing that's changing stepwise. So that's kind of the reason why we did it on B. But your your answers are my I think my answers are a little bit of a smart ass answer. Your answer is a little closer because it has to be a discrete set, not finite, but discrete. And it has to have a base case. So in other words, it has to be what we call an inductively defined set. It has to have a smallest element. And if you're at n, you have to be able to define n plus one. And the integers do that very nicely, but these other strange monsters like the real numbers and floating points don't have that. Because if I asked you what's the next number after pi, you're not gonna be able to answer that because under the standard ordering of the real numbers, we don't have a next number. So we have to induct on B because it has to be an inductively defined set, namely a set with a basis and a set that has a next element or a successor function. Okay, pretty interesting. Now, and by the way, scheme supports floating point numbers and complex numbers, so you can actually do this. Second question. So in this proof, I used induction plus the substitution model. Why did we have to use both? Couldn't we've used just one of those? Why do you need both of these things? Is that because like for using um, the substitution like model, you are actually proving that like the induction step is like true? Like you need to prove why PB can, uh, can prove like PB plus one is true. I, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Um, in other words, um, I think you're completely on the right track. So in other words, the induction will get you from one thing to the next, but we're trying to improve things about code. So you need to know what the value of the code is. So remember, and in, in scheme, everything is an expression. Every expression has a value. So you don't know what the values are unless you have the substitution model. So the substitution model tells you what your code means, not only in this case where we have it set up in the theorem at the, at the top, but every one of these steps where we have code, we need to have substitution model because it tells you what is the meaning of that, what's the value of that expression. Meaning is value in this case. So if we didn't have the substitution model, the code would just be characters on a page. It wouldn't have a semantics. It wouldn't have a mechanical procedure for reducing expressions to values. So you need induction to count, you need induction to get an infinite number of results, all the integers. You need the substitution model to tell you what code means. There's a corollary of this. I know from experience some of you may have encountered a situation where you were asked in a course to prove that an algorithm was correct, where the algorithm maybe was written in some language, or maybe it was in pseudocode. And that's fine, but you should be aware that unless there's a semantics for the language and you used it, and unless there's a semantics for the pseudocode, then your proof is an informal argument because you haven't said in the, how to take statements of the pseudocode and how to reduce those to values. Some languages do have semantics. ML has semantics, Haskell has semantics, Scheme has semantics, but many others don't. So uh, it's okay to do that, but it's worth, but not in this class. And you want to be aware that you're doing it, that you're making an informal argument instead. So that's why we need both the substitution model and we need, um, induction to do this. Are there any other questions about this proof? Or induction, substitution model, what we've talked about? Ask now, we have plenty of time. Question here. Uh, we have one question in the chat asking what's the definition of the induction hypothesis? 
Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Let me try to uh, answer that. I'll try to use paper here. Ooh, I'm running out of paper. Who would have thought? All right, so look at this last step here uh, in the induction recipe. So this is, the, this is the induction step, I'll write it out. It's fine. All right, and you can write this in several ways. You can say, show Or you could say show these are all equivalent. Or as they say in mathematics, the following are equivalent. So in here, the induction hypothesis is Pn. Now there's some semantic way of thinking about this. You could say the induction hypothesis is assume P of N, but it's this, this thing here. So you assume that and you prove this. So in our case, it's exactly as shown. The induction hypothesis is exactly this thing in a red box here. Does that help? And notice we have that formal formalism. Assume P is true for B. Again, this part here is the induction hypothesis. Assume P is true for B, show it's true for B plus one. More questions? Um, yeah, I have a question concerning the, why the induction on B and not on A. So you said the conclusive reason was that, A, I mean, it has to be an inductively defined set, right? and B could be, or A could be a matrix or anything else. But what you also said is that um, B, uh, that B, no, that A within the code, it never really changes. So it would make sense to do induction on it. Now, what if you reverse that? If you would say A is an integer and B is a number, how would you reconcile that in the code um, that it would make sense to use induction on it? I don't think the code would work if I, I don't, I don't believe the code would work if you switched those and then expected them to multiply A times B. Okay. So I would say that looking at the code and seeing what's changing is a heuristic to see how to construct a proof, what variable, that the mathematical reasoning is that it has to be over an inductively defined set. So I would say being over an inductively defined set is necessary, but not sufficient. So let me rephrase your example. Suppose I change the code here to make A an integer. So now they're both over inductively defined sets, but you still have a choice of which one to induct on, and clearly B is the answer, right? Yeah. Okay, so inductively defined set is necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, then you have to look at the code and decide what is changing in some sense. In my experience, students find that explanation, maybe not all students, some find it a little bit mystical. And it requires the artistry of being able to look at the code and seeing what to induct on. And so I'd like to motivate this by saying I'm going to make A as general as possible so that we can have code with greater expressive power. So we can use this to multiply anything by an integer. It could be a vector, it could be a complex number, it could be an imaginary number, it could be a floating point number, it could be a matrix, and so forth. Um, and so that by saying that I wanted to state the code in such a way as to make this uh, have great expressive power, like almost any type can be for A, it becomes kind of natural to then induct on the thing that has an inductively defined set, since we know that for some of those other beasts, it's not as easy to, or even possible to do induction. So I like to motivate it by saying we can make times one more general than just multiplying two integers. And once we've done that, we could be giving A a set that you can't do induction on. But the real reason is that B is changing in such a way that 
you know, from the code itself, you can see there's a base case and there's an inductive step. And the base case involves only looking at B, and the inductive step involves defining the value of times one in terms of B at lower values, which gives you the cue that it's induction. And there is a smart ass answer too, which is that if you induct on A, it won't work. This is a, not a strongest argument because you might want to show that this works for all A. I've done that by letting A be arbitrary, but you can imagine a case where you also wanted to do a double induction over A, but we're not going to do that for a while. Are you happy with that answer? Yes, thank you. Sure, thanks for asking. Okay, well, I, wanna, I wanna do some more, uh, you know, talking about this. So I'm going to uh, take you back over to the tablet. All right, so let's do a little bit more as we delve into this. I'm going to share my tablet screen and talk about a few more things as we do, do this. I'm going to share content screen. Good. All right, so we did that by hand, but I did write out the proof uh, for you in, uh, you know, typed it out. And I want to mention that if you look at the website, uh, I actually did the proof where we assumed the induction hypothesis for B minus one and proved it for B. So both of those proofs are already there on the website and you can take a look at them if, if um, you want to review, as well as this video. Okay, so to kind of summarize what we're going to uh, talk about next, um, we did this proof by hand, but later we're going to talk more about checking that a procedure's computation meets the specification, certain criteria. And in this case, it turns out that in real software engineering, saying what you want, like doing the specification, is a real challenge. It's actually harder than the verification part. And automatically generating correctness proofs is a very active area of research, and it matters a lot for critical applications. So even here at Duke, not as much as other places, other places, when critical machines die, when x-ray machines fail, people die, aircraft control, reactor control, you know, hardened military infrastructure, banking, robotics, all these things, how do you know your code is correct? How do you know it's doing what you say? This is the basic framework for knowing that and proving it. And so we'll come back to this a few times during the class as applications, but I'm trying to give you the mathematical foundations between this. And of course, we're doing something really quite cool. Um, all right. So I want to come back to the let form a little bit. I think we have time for a couple of minutes. Um, and you might notice that I introduced this, I didn't really make a huge deal about it. And that's because it's just syntactic sugar in some sense. So it's, it's basically writing something you already know. So let's look over here at a, a simpler let statement than we had before. Let x be five. And then what we're gonna say is let's now return the value plus x 10. And I think you can pretty quickly see just kind of looking at this returns the value 15. But it's got this weird thing in here and I've been really careful or tried to be really careful about what do the expressions mean? Like, I mean, how do we know what they're saying? Why is he being so informal about this? Well, the thing is that when we have an expression that doesn't really need any more syntax, it's just equivalent to being rewritten as another scheme form, then we're pretty happy. So this is actually just as syntax for the following thing. So what we do is we take 
make a procedure. And that procedure is going to plus x with 10. That's our procedure. And we're going to then take what, what we do with the let statement is we're going to just take that thing and we're going to apply this to 5. And you can use the substitution model and you can see this is going to be 15. So the point is that this and this are exactly equivalent. And in fact, in the compiler, when you write this thing here, it gets rewritten as that. So that's why we didn't get too excited about let because it's just a lambda. In fact, you can build most things in scheme that are complicated out of lambda. And similarly, this creature here, we can read it now. Let's look at this beast. Let x be five, let y be 10. Now compute plus x, y, seven. This is gonna return 22. And that's just equal to this thing here. We'll do it here. We write uh, a function of two variables, x and y, and what are we going to return? We're going to return the plus of x, y, and 7. There we go. And we're going to just take this thing, we're going to apply it to 5 and 10. And this is going to return 22. So how do you know this is true? You don't even need induction for these numbers, that is. Just use the substitution model, the lambda versions, and you should be able to verify that, in fact, this returns 15 and this returns 22. So. In other words, just as before, this form here is syntactic sugar for this lambda expression. In other words, when you do this, it gets rewritten as this and evaluated by the compiler. You already know how to evaluate functions and lambda expressions. So that's really what let is. Let is lambdas, which can be nested or not. So if you're if you could just read the let expressions and you're writing code, that's fine. But if you want to know what it's really doing, it's doing this and it's doing that. And we'll, we'll do more examples of this in recitation and in, in class. So to summarize, what are the big ideas today? We did a lot of computer science. So a procedure that just refers to itself is called syntactically recursive. Just has the name in there. So a syntactically recursive procedure, namely a procedure that names itself, that guy can generate one of two kinds of processes, a recursive process or an iterative process. Iterative processes are also called tail recursive processes. The key issue is, are there deferred operations? That's the key thing you want to know. And of course, you can reveal that there are deferred operations in one way using the substitution model. That's the only way you should use. And the tail recursive processes can be compiled to run in constant space, whereas the recursive processes will take more space for larger inputs and will eventually die for lack of space. Now, as mentioned, and we had some great questions about this from the studio audience, induction, we use it to prove things about inductively defined sets, like the natural numbers. So sets that are discrete, they can be infinite. They have to have a smallest element or the basis case. And if you know element n, you can get to n plus one. You can always get to a next one. There's a next function. So using them together, induction plus a model of evaluation, in this case, substitution model, can be used to show that a procedure meets some specification. That is, it is correct. And we talked about the semantics of let. So now you know something about induction, which is not only important in computer science, but actually very important in uh, mathematics in general. And I want to close by telling you a joke. Let me mention, having studied mathematics at several places, that if, if we ever open up our, uh, after we have vaccines and therapies for COVID and you can go to parties again, if you ever want the party to end, you can tell some of these math jokes and most people will leave. The ones that don't probably will follow you to graduate school at MIT. So, induction joke. So there's a sociologist, very bright, minoring in psychology, and she wants to know, to gauge, you know, how bright certain people in certain professions are, and give them a mathematical puzzle. So she goes to them and asks them the following question, she asks them to prove that all odd numbers are prime. She goes to the mathematician. Mathematician says, 
prove all odd numbers of prime. I think I could do this. You know, I took CS230 with Bruce Donald. I can do it. Let's do it. So one's a prime, three's a prime, five's a prime. By induction, all odd numbers of primes. Then she goes to physicist, says, Mr. Physicist, do this experiment. I'd like you to prove for me that all odd numbers are prime. Physicist goes, no problem. You know, I took a lot of math. I think I could do this. Let's do this. Okay, one's a prime, three's a prime, five's a prime, seven's a prime, nine's a prime. Wait, nine's not a prime. Hmm. Come on, but 11's a prime, 13's a prime. Experimental error, no problem. Clearly, empirically, all odd numbers are prime. Then she goes to engineer. Engineer says, I, I got this. You know, I studied, you know, I studied some, some of this stuff. I think I could prove it. Engineer says, one's a prime, three's a prime, five's a prime, seven's a prime, nine's a prime, eleven's a prime, thirteen's a prime, fifteen's a prime. No problem. All the odd numbers are prime, clearly true. Then she goes to a fellow sociologist, said, Okay, hey, can you just prove all the numbers are prime? I said, I think I remember this. I've taken some stats. Two's a prime, four's a prime, six a prime, eight a prime, so forth. Finally, she gets to the computer scientist and says, This will really round out my study. Help me prove that all odd numbers are prime. Computer scientist thinks about it and says, I can do this. One's a prime, three's a prime, five's 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 a prime. Okay, we're almost out of time. So on that note, uh, I've left you some stuff to read in the lecture notes. And uh, if you'd like to stay and ask questions of me and possibly the TAs, I will stay till the end of lecture and somewhat beyond and be happy to take your, um, your questions. Uh, so I'm gonna stop the screen sharing and the recording and uh, then let those who want to go do that. And I will uh, look forward to seeing you all on.